bless you. I got into something, didn't I? Uh, I want to thank the Lord real well for undertaking for Brother Caps's boy. It uh, just so happened that this is the little time that I come back to Indiana. I know that they're not recording this, I suppose. And so then, I don't see nobody in there. So they, I come back to squirrel hunt. <laughs> and so uh, I guess Charlie's going to have to put up with me, him and Nellie and them down in Kentucky now for a day or two to squirrel hunt. So uh, I'd rather miss anything, any other kind of recreation than come here on about the middle of August and go squirrel hunting with Charlie and Banks and all of them. It's kind of a traditional thing with me. And so uh, I took Joe, when we was here the other time, everybody got sick. It changed from that real hot climate down to this, to this cool climate you got here. I know you think it's not cool, but you come out to Arizona once. <laughs> it's 109 in the shade when I left the other morning. And then at around midnight in the night, when the cool air come down off the mountain, it's still 96. <laughs> See, that's at midnight when the cool air was coming down. And so it's that place is all right in the wintertime, but it's for scorpions and lizards in the summertime, not human beings. Even all the animals take off for the mountains. They just can't stand it. And I'd been out to shoot my little rifle in. Uh, somehow, I just want to tell you about the little Caps boy. And I said, and Joe... I just have to give him the rifle because he can outshoot me. <laughs> we got it shot in, and I, I drive and tax 50 yards, and I said to, to Joel, Joel said, Daddy, I believe I can do that. Poor little fellow had a headache. I've been praying for him, a high fever. He went out the range with me. And, uh, any uh, two over 10 bore in a 22 rifle that crosses its line of fire at 25 yards is in again at 50, just the same, if it's two over 10. So then, um, and I had shot it in 25 yards, and so I had two more tacks, and I put up it. You know, Joe didn't drive both of them tacks. I didn't have any more tacks, so I put a little bit of piece of an old clay pigeon had been bursted there, what trap shooters shoot at, just about a quarter of an inch across, and tuck it out on 50 yards, and he cut it half in two. And the scope was set for my eyes, just a few years older than he was. So he said, you know what? I've got to go by and tell Billy to keep off of my feet from now on. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, well, I'll tell you what. I said, let's go down and show Brother Norman that. I said, Joe, and matches across the world. I don't care who it would be, nobody. Now, the tax wasn't drove sideways. They were drove straight through. And that piece, not over, uh, I guess, a quarter of an inch and a sixteenth thick and a quarter of an inch high, he cut it half and two at 50 yards. I said, there's no one in the world could have made a better shot. They could, a champions could have done the same thing, but you couldn't have made three better shots than them. The tack's not bent, just a straight hole through the paper where the tack went through. And uh, I said, no one could have made a, a better shot. Oh, I, I think his headache left him right away. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, let's go show this to Brother Norman, which works for the field and stream, Brother Tony Strami's sporting goods place. He said, um, let's go buy Billy's first. He said, I, I just want to tell Bubby something. <laughs> and um, frankly, his brother's never done that good. <laughs> so he said, uh, we go by there first. And just as I got in the door, Billy was still in his pajamas. And he said, we went out early because it gets so hot. And uh, so he said, um, the phone rang. And I said, uh, he kind of looked at me like that. I said, maybe a sick call. And it was Brother Caps for his boy in the operating room then with paraninitis and that pending. And uh, just now he told me his boy's recovering real, real good. So see how God just worked that even in the voice of that little boy, Joe, instead of going down to Brother Norman's, wouldn't have been there and come up. And Brother Caps and I joined together. Now, I don't say it was our prayers that done it, but it did mean something to him. For us to make contact like that, and frankly, that's what when you got you've got to have faith in what you're doing, see. And that, his faith, the call, and Billy was is putting in money. He said this must be a real long distance. He says he's putting in for five dollars worth of change in a three for a three minute call. And I thought it'd be coming from New York or out in one of the islands or something, but he made a person to person call to get Billy instead of Lois. You see, and that's what it cost him to do that. 
And now his boy is recovering. Brother Cap said the doctor gave him very little hope of ever coming out of it, you see, from the operation. And we're thankful to God this morning. Amen. Yeah, yeah, very glad for him. Now, we got in towards daylight this morning, and uh, I had about three hours sleep, and, and I'm pretty tired, but when the church come time to come to church, well, I, I come down. And uh, uh, the Lord willing, now I've got to go down in Kentucky, as I said, then I've got promised to speak one Sunday while I was back here, and I better make it this next Sunday because the following, I'll be, I have to go back because I'm going away again up in Canada. So I, I better make it next Sunday, and next Sunday morning. And um, Brother Neville said, why don't you just go out and greet the people and talk to them just a few minutes? I said, Brother Neville, I haven't even opened my Bible. Or I said, uh, he said, well, go out and say something to them. And uh, Sister Neville, I, I, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, he's a very persuasive fellow. <laughs> But while I don't get a chance to say this when the place is all packed and crowded and everything, but I'm very grateful to God for a pastor like Brother Armand Neville. Amen. Faithful, just as faithful as he can be to the cause. And never hear him grumbling. I sat back there. I had a good half hour's talk with him while I was enjoying Brother Mann. And uh, so I'll tell you more about that when we get to Colorado this year. So when we was uh, enjoying his message... And uh, I got a good talk with Brother Neville. I said, I don't even get to tell the people nothing about our fine pastor. I said, are the people treating you right? He said, it couldn't be any better. And I said, well, that's what I'm glad to hear. When a pastor's satisfied and the people satisfied, it makes a real good church. And then God is satisfied. And I think to see them satisfied together, especially in this day of the message that we're carrying I think that shows the continuity of the message with the people and with God, see? And I'm very grateful for Brother Armand Neville and his fine wife and family. And I pray that God will keep them loyal to him and the cause. And if it so please him, may we be standing here in the tabernacle when the Lord Jesus comes for us, you see, to, to take us away at the rapture. We... Hope we're both so old, Brother Neville, with one head, one arm around the other, and stand there on our king, still trying to hold up. See? But then we'll be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And these old robes of flesh will drop and rise and seize the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air. Farewell, farewell. Sweet hour of prayer. We moved on up then. Heard about Brother Coomer's healing from the Lord, and so thankful for that. So many things. So I am uh, grateful to be here this morning. And I thought, instead of, I'm always coming here with a certain text and speaking. I thought I'd just tell out this morning. And I said, Brother Neville, I'll watch the clock real easy and probably let the people out on time. And, and just talk to you from the heart a few minutes. Just things just that we just have a, no, they're not taping it or anything. So we just have fellowship while it's just a, church folks here, you see, just us together. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we are grateful to you for the privilege that we have of assembling together here. No, as I looked upon this tabernacle early this morning after midnight, passed by, I thought of how you have stood by it. And I think of the old pond that was here and big old weed standing up right about where this pulpit sat. As a little boy, I, I stood here and Mr. Ingram said we could have the lot for just a little money and pay something down and no money, no collateral or nothing to offer, but just to try how that it then as full face value it was a little over $2,000 with 20 years to pay it out. And now, Lord, look at it now. While it was in its infancy, still sitting down in a hole here, water pouring into it, now that you promised us by the word, I, the Lord, have planted it out of water day and night, lest some shall pluck it from my hands. The same time the people said within six months it'll be turned into a garage. 
But literally thousands of souls has found Christ here at the altar. And the tabernacle, the baptistry, has constantly people has been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, calling upon his name, washing away their sins. Hundreds of crippled, afflicted, blind, halt, lame, cancer-eaten have walked away from this platform, come in, dying men, women, boys and girls, and gone out to live a new life with a new flesh on their bodies and walking again, leave their wheelchairs, crutches, and so forth. All got this 30 years of service. Father, I remember the morning that we laid the cornerstone and you gave the vision over there showing the place packed and jammed a beautiful corner. I, I knew that that could not fail. So I thank you for all these things. Many of them have done, fought a good fight and finished the course and kept the faith. Laying out or waiting, resting now from their labors and their works following them. Waiting for the hour for the trumpet to sound and to spring forth again into new life a new body, many of them old and shaken, some young, middle-aged, and so forth. But thy name be praised for all. Now we're standing here again before the, the living and the dead. I pray that you'll anoint your words this morning. I don't know one thing to say, but I pray that you'll furnish that which you've always did it, Lord. Bless our pastor, Brother Neville, his wife. Bless the trustees, deacon boards, every member of the body. May together we live so in this life that in the life to come we'll have eternal life. Help us this morning to take corrections from the Spirit and the Word that we might prepare ourselves as we move away from the doors this morning, determined in our heart to live a better life than we have in the past. Amen. We asked it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I, I just opened the Bible here, and it happened to be a few minutes ago. I'm in Revelation 3, so I'll just uh, read here on the, the uh, message to the Lady Osea Church. And I want to announce also, Brother Neville, just tell me, Brother Parnell, as I have to look down and see him sitting here, is in a, in a revival just this side of Memphis. At the, the, any of you know where the old wimpy, the hamburger stand used to be? He's got a, a tent sitting in there uh, trying to uh, bring in the sheaves and find if there's any lost ones out in that way that's been ordained to life that he might win through his ministry to Christ. And he closed it up for Sunday on account of the services being the tabernacle. And, and that's very loyal of the brother. And we want you to know that the service will be on Monday night following next week. And I know you're all cordially invited out to hear Brother Parnell bring his message of the love of Christ. And now let us read from Revelation, the third chapter. Just a portion to say that we read the Bible because what I'd say might fail. But what he says won't fail. And I don't know where to start from, what to do, where to go, but I'm just reading the Lady of Sea Church Age. Unto the angel of the church of Lady of Sin, write these things, saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness and the beginning of the creation of God, I know thy works, thou art neither cold or hot. I would were it that cold or hot. So then because art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because I sayest, I'm rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes, say, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
You know, somewhere in there, as I was reading, uh, if you'll excuse me a minute, I, I found some place that sounded good to me, and I don't know just where it was at now. Um, here it is, and knowest thou not, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, oh my. That's kind of the picture here of the church of today. Now it's, uh, I think that that church age here that we're speaking of, of course I've got the church age coming forth now in the books, but being that is the Lady of Sin church age that we're in, let's just look at the conditions. I don't want to take any text or anything because we're not just talking casually as we see to talk on whatever the Lord would lead us to do, but something that would help us. Let's think of the Lady of Sia Church Age and its condition today. As far as I know, I don't see anything to hinder at this time uh, the coming of the Lord Jesus outside of the readiness of His church. I think that one of the, the prophecies yesterday coming up in the car, we drove it in two days from Tucson here, right? 2,000 miles. And Billy and I. And so, we, uh, now that wasn't breaking any speed laws. We stayed right. I sat there, if he's driving, I, I'm all, all got my fist back like a shotgun with a hammer back. I see him go, I said, wait a minute, boy. Uh, we are told, give Caesar what Caesar's. Amen. Then we come in down here last night, a little girl laying sprawled across the road about three years old. Mother dead over in a ditch. Some drunken boy coming from the ROTC is 18 years old, driving 120 miles an hour on the left-hand side of the road, killed, and I guess he was dying too. Then you can realize what it is. Give Caesar what Caesar's. Innocent people dying, a little three-year-old girl lost her life because of some drunken soldier. Uh, driving 120 miles an hour, estimated, on the wrong side of the road. Coming up over the hill, shot right down, killed him, all right there together. I, he was dying too, so then you can see, even though the innocent party was doing, now that boy is guilty of cold-blooded murder. I think if a man would be caught on the road drinking, he ought to be given 10 years flat for premature, premeditated murder. Any man calls it just, any man... We, we'll never do any good with politics. It's rotten. God's idea of having a king, a righteous king, is right. The politics just simply spread out. You can buy anything out. Cheap, lie, steal, everything else. As I said a few Sundays ago, and look where you're at. See? Nothing but just a crooked mass of everything. But a righteous king can make his own laws. And you can kill a man... You know, a good politics, that's all right. You get out of it, see? And so it's, it, it, the democracy is a good idea, but it won't work. you like communism. All things in common. It sounds good, but it won't work. No, the, God's way of having a king like David was, was right. And you got one mind centered over like one leader and a bunch of geese or so forth. You can't take two or three of them. And then you mess them all together. You come up with any kind of an idea. So we find the conditions today ready for the coming of the Lord. But while Brother Neville and I and these other brothers are trying to shepherd a flock, I've got something on my mind now that comes that we might talk about. That is... I got a letter the other day from a fine lady. I never got it come through another person. And she was certainly tearing me to pieces or trying to. Was saying, did you ever, can't you Christian businessman do something to stop Brother Branham? Said because that he's got this book out now called The Lady of Sea Church Age. Bring it out more. 
and said, he's just simply tearing Pentecostal doctrine to pieces. Said, now he's talking about the initial evidence, ain't speaking in tongues. And said, then he's against women preachers, and this was a woman preacher. And her boys, some of the best friends that I got in the world. She, they're among the best friends that I got. And she said, now, and this man and wife, I was eating breakfast with him. They said, Brother Bram, look at this. Would you think it? And pulled out a letter. I said, well, sister, she just don't understand. The boys told me their mother was a woman preacher and that she didn't go for the message. And now she says in here, she said, now he said, women should not have authority over man. Said, how about Phoebe in the Bible? <laughs> Paul's helper, certainly. She was a seller of goods. And uh, Paul asked the people, you think Paul would say, let the women keep silent in the churches, not permitting them to speak, and turn around and say, now Phoebe, my helper in the gospel, she should go to preach in a few nights. Well, he'd contradict his own word. Amen. Right. And said then, atop it all, I believe it was Esther was one of the judges in the Bible. Said a woman was a judge in the Bible. If that's not authority over man, and this businessman that was healed right here in the church not long ago, he said, now, his wife said, Brother Bram, that always puzzled me. I said, well, sister, how would that puzzle you? He said, well, here is a woman judge. I said, that's politics, not the church. Amen. Now, I had nothing to do with the church. Paul said, let it be under obedience as all so saith the law. Right. And the law can't put a woman up to be a priest. Can't put it up. You never seen a woman high priest. You never seen a woman a priest. Right. Nowhere in the Bible. You never seen a woman a preacher in the Bible. Amen. Certainly, some of them was prophetess and so forth. Miriam and different ones and Esther. Or one of them was a judge over Israel. Sometimes there were queens over them and so forth. Like that king and queen, the decease of the king. The queen had to take his place to elect another king and so forth. In Tucson, in Tucson Arizona. We got a woman judge there in the city. That's the reason the city's so polluted. And we got a woman ain't got no business in politics. She got no business in the in, over any authority in the church. Her place is a man's queen at home. Outside of that, she has nothing. And we know that to be the truth. You will never find it. I know that sounds old fashioned, but I'm responsible. And I know that after my going away from this earth, them tapes and them books will be living on and many of you young children will find the days to come and this is exactly the truth. Because I speak it in the name of the Lord. Now we wonder how a woman that's a good woman and she is brought on this earth by her loyal husband, a good man, some of the finest boys that I ever met, they're men uh, that I've ever met. And just quickly, just as soon as they heard the message, they were sold on it 100%. Now, that can only come by foreordination. The only way it can come. Now, the question is here, I was thinking that, see now why the Lord was bringing me back to know it, know it, know it not. Dark, naked, miserable, wretched, blind, and know it not. Before I get to that spot, I might brief what I said a few days ago here in a message on, I believe it was the uh, God of this world blinded the eyes of the people that they absolutely worship the devil in religious services. Did you all get that? All of you understood it? And then in that same message, I brought the subject that a woman wearing immoral clothes indecently, she is be judged at the judgment bar as a street prostitute. That sounds awful strange. Let me draw you a little picture. Now, here is an attorney in the city, a young fellow, and he's a nice man as far as as a politically, I imagine he may be decent in his politics. And then um, he goes to the girl that's very popular. They fall in love and marry. 
They tend to all the parties and the great uh, things, and they all drink together. Finally, she uh, he has a nice home. He lives in a nice uh, neighborhood. He's uh, well thought of amongst the people, but he, both of them drink. She wears shorts, cuts her hair, wears makeup, everything, just as sexy as beautiful woman, displaying herself. Well, she never goes to church at all, neither one of them. So, moving next door to him comes a woman from the Baptist church or the Methodist church, her and her husband. Now, this woman, uh, let's make it Methodist because... The Methodists go a little more on holiness than the Baptists, all except the New Testament Baptists, they believe in holiness. But usually Baptists don't go for holiness at all. See, they don't believe in such a thing. So then, now let's make it Methodist cause to believe in holiness. And uh, then a Methodist woman moves next door to this woman on the same street. Her husband is, uh, let's say he's a public accountant and, uh, or some office. Well, this Methodist woman looks over to the other woman, and when this lawyer goes out of town, say his name's John. Say his name is John. Now, don't presume on that now. I'm just taking fiction names now. And his name is John. Well, she used to go with Ralph. And that's fiction name, all of it. So you just so you get the story to make the picture. Well, First thing you know, at a drunken party, Ralph hugs her again. Well, she gets all fired up because she's in love again with Ralph, she thinks. Then after a while, Ralph begins to meet her. And she can put it over John, pull it over his eyes, and she thinks she's a pretty smart duck because she can run with Ralph married to John. See, the woman don't even have the very bearing of decency. And... She thinks nothing about that. But this Methodist woman has raised up in another bracket. She does at least go to church. And she thinks that that woman is horrible. Why, she says to her husband when he comes in, I see that man go in there and meet her. And when John's out on a case somewhere, Philadelphia somewhere, he takes her out in his roadster. And they lay out on the beach. I see him come home, don't even pull the curtains down sometimes, kissing her and making love to her next door. Oh, isn't that awful, she says to her husband. Well, she's nothing but a public prostitute. It's true. She's worse than a public prostitute because she's a married woman. And she, uh, this woman, this Methodist woman thinks that's horrible. She never goes to church. Now, this Methodist woman would not do a thing like that. No, indeed. She's a decent woman. And another thing, she would not touch a bit of whiskey because the Methodist Church, 90% of their program is prohibition against whiskey, against whiskey. So they got a prohibition program, and then people of that Methodist Church don't live no higher than that church teaches. But this same woman, this Methodist woman, goes out of the evening with her husband wearing shorts on Sunday after Sunday school. She cuts her hair, she wears lipstick, and even smokes a little. Now, in God's word, there are both prostitutes. But this one here is naked, miserable, wretched, blind, and don't know it. One's just as guilty as the other. For a man that looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if this woman, now she'd say, wait just a minute, Mr. Branham. I'll give you to understand, I am no prostitute. My sister, maybe if you'd be tucked before a Bible and put your hands up on the presence of God and swear oh, that you've been just as true, true to your husband as you can be. Your body belongs to your husband, but your soul belongs to God. Amen. There is an evil spirit that's annoying you. If, that, if you're not, then you're, I can prove that you're totally insane. What would happen if your grandmother should walk down the street with them shorts on? They'd put her in the insane institution. She'd come out without her dress on. There's something wrong with her mind. If it was so then, it's so now. So it throws the whole world into insanity. The whole thing's insane. 
And it's so gradually crept in until the people don't know it. Amen. Now, is she a prostitute? Not by her husband vow to her body, but before God she's got a evil prostitute spirit on her that makes her dress like that and she's in the lady of sin church age and don't know that she's doing that. An innocent woman don't know that God will judge her for a prostitute. There you are. You get it to her. You can't tell her. There's no way of getting it to her. The Bible said they're naked and don't know it. Amen. Amen. If you call her a prostitute personally, she'd have you arrested. She would. I never talk personally about anybody. I talk about sin. I don't say this certain church, Mr. So-and-so, Reverend So-and-so, he's a... No, no, I say that, the doctrine of that. The, the whole Amen. thing together. I don't call individuals. It's not individuals. It's the system that they're in. It's a wild system. Brother George Wright sitting here... 75 or 78 years old, I guess. What would you think would have happened if you'd have went to see Sister Wright someday and she'd been standing in a pair of shorts? Well, you'd have never, you'd have, you'd have had the woman locked up. You'd have never married her. Well, if any young man in that day would have done it, the same thing would have took place. Well, if it was sin and wrong then, it's the same thing, but the people have grown into insanity. Amen. Let me prophesy something to you just before it comes to pass. The whole world is grouping in insanity and will get worse and worse and worse. Amen. I'm telling you, I'll be a bunch of maniacs. Amen. It's almost that way now. Amen. Could you imagine a man driving with his lights off on the wrong side of the road? A ricky young kid supposed to be right out of high school. Kill a bunch of people. Is that stop him? The next one come right behind him doing the same thing. Can you imagine a young man that thinks that himself, anything of himself getting out here and acting the way they do? Could you imagine a young woman in a bloom of womanhood, beautiful, well-built, shape, profile, face, beautiful, and the very thing of her being pretty shows that we're at the end time. See, she's went altogether to worldly feature, worldly things, and not the beauty of holiness, Amen. sweetness in her soul. I've seen women on the outside of them, wasn't nothing to look at, but you speak to them one time, talk to them a few Amen. minutes, they're real genuine, something that you can't get away from. Amen. See, the beauty of the outside is of the devil. It's of the world. Look at Cain's children, how they went into it. When the sons of God saw the daughters of man were fair, they take none of them wives, and God never did forgive them. Look at them Israelite women with, with calloused hands and hair stringing. When them sons of God came up through the land of Moab and met them dainty women with well-set hair, fancy and a lot of manicure on their faces or what you call it, and when them sons of God saw those real fair women, a false prophet said, we're all the same. Yeah, that's right. And they married among them, and God never did forgive them. They perished in the wilderness. Every one of them died there. Without hope, without God, is eternally lost. Them forever. Though they had seen the goodness of God. Amen. Though they had drank from the fountain that never runs dry. They had dropped from the smitten rock. They had seen the brass serpent perform miracles. They had come out from under the baptism of Moses in the sea. They had seen the hand of God. They had eaten angels' food. They had done all those things, but married in. Let women bring them in. And marry among them. Not commit adultery, just marry among them. God never did forgive it. That's the second time it met. Now here we are on the third time. More deceiving now than ever. I know that's hard. And I've often wondered, in many ways, how will it ever be? Why do I have to talk so rational to people? What makes it so? And yet I notice, 
If it wasn't God, there wouldn't be nobody, not a woman, to sit and listen at me. Amen. But they come back. Amen. Because there's somebody that's got a little anchor of truth there that knows that that's right. Amen. Regardless, they know it's right. Now watch what happened. I know it's hard. It's just like if a doctor gives you medicine and you refuse to take it, then don't blame the doctor if you die. And this is like medicine. What about these people? They always claim to me be a woman hater. You see, you just watch the way the women act and I'll show you where the church is. The women morals is a lady of see in the world, physically, naked, miserable, blind, and don't know it. The, ch- the people, the women of the world, and the church is in the same stage. Watch the natural type, the spiritual, right through each time. Now, someday at the judgment bar, I know it's not popular to say it. And if a man's not ordained to say it, you better not say it. Because you're impersonating and then you'll get in trouble, sure enough. Now notice, I've actually looked like in times held a woman's mouth open and poured the medicine in her mouth. And then I hold my hands over her mouth and she'll spit it out every time. What if a doctor did that to a patient, then the patient died? Because they refused to swallow the medicine. At the judgment bar, when all these things like cutting hair and wearing shorts and I'm only building the hours close at hand when you're going to see something happen. When something's going to take place and all this background here has only been laying a foundation for a short, quick message that'll shake the whole nations. While I've been picking on women, it's just been laying up here for something that you can hit around the head with it. Even trying to tell them what's right now, holding a hand down like this, this is where the mouth is spitting out. Then who can blame the doctor? How are you going to say at the day of the judgment when the very voices that's cried out against it will play the record right back in the face of the people? Then how are they going to get away from it? Spit it out between your fingers. Pour some more down and finally shake their head and re- go back and go back. Won't do it. Yet you come back again and pour it in again. Then who's to blame? Not the doctor. Not the medicine. But the attitude of the person. That's exactly. It'll be a horrible day one of these days. When this sinful adulterous generation stands before Almighty God. I see my years creeping up. My shoulders stooping. And I know uh, 30 years here in this platform. We have 33 years. Here on the field. That's a long life. That's 33 years of service. Only one regret I have, that I didn't have 133 years of it. Or this will be the last opportunity I'll ever have while you're mortal to preach the gospel. God help me to stand true as true can be to that word. Say just as he says. What made that Methodist woman? How could you ever get a tour? Here she is in that lady of see a church age. Now we'll take the Pentecostal woman. She shouldn't wear shorts, make up or cut her hair. But she looks back down at the Methodist, say, look at that woman do so and so. Say the woman don't wear shorts. But she say look and herself with bob hair. Right. Hmm? Higher you rise in God, the more sinful the whole thing looks. And then sometimes in prayer you can imagine when the Holy Spirit Take you up into a sphere. Then the whole thing looks chaos. Then when you come back down, you seem like you're, to the people, you're a rascal. That you're, you're a, nothing but an old sarcastic, you're a fool. Because you stand as an old crank and always rebuking the people. But if you ever climb into them spheres one time, where you can be in the presence of God, not through emotion, but to genuine Holy Spirit lifting up 
The whole thing is wrote Echabod. The glory of the Lord has departed from the whole denominational outfit. That's right. There's none of them. That's right. Now let me draw you a little circle. If I had a blackboard, but I want you to watch here. I'm going to make one ring like this. I'm going to make another ring on the inside of that ring. That's two. Then I'm going to make a ring on the inside of that ring. That's three rings. Three circles. Now that's you. That's God. God in a trinity is one, and without a trinity, he's not God. He can't be manifested any other way. And neither can you be manifested without being the trinity person that you are. That's body, spirit, soul. Without either one of them, you're not complete. Amen. See? If you didn't have a soul, you'd be nothing. If you didn't have a spirit, you wouldn't be nothing. If you didn't have a body, you'd be a spirit, not a body. So God is complete in the triunity of a being. Not triunity of beings, but one being in a triunity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is one true manifested God. God, notice here, this way, I, I believe I read it just a few minutes ago. Listen to this. Unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans, write these things, saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Amen. God is a creator, and how was he ever created? But this is the beginning of the creation of God. When God the Spirit was created in a form of a man, that was God being created. God the Creator Himself becoming a creation. God who made the dirt, made the calcium, made the potash, cosmic light, petroleum, took the thing together and created Himself in the beginning of the creation of God. The Amen, the final. Amen means so be it. The final of God when God completed in His creation. Now, how was it? No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten of the Father has declared Him. You get it? Say, just a minute. You know, hurry. Let's turn over to Colossians. Just a minute. I just have to come to Scripture in my mind. Let's turn to Colossians, the book of Colossians, and get the, I believe it's the first chapter. I'll have to look this because it's not premeditated here, so I'll, as I used to be when I was a young preacher, I could think of these things just right now, but as I get older, I can't. Let's begin at the ninth verse, I believe. For this cause is Paul telling the Colossians about Christ, who he was. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom of spirit and understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and to the increase in the knowledge of God strengthen all according to the glorious power of patience and long suffering with joy giving thanks to the Father which is me which made us me to partakers of the inheritance of the saints, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Here we're getting now. Watch. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin, who is in the image of the invisible God. Get it? 15th verse. Colossians 1.15. The firstborn of every creature. Amen. 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 The what? The firstborn of every creature. Let it be angel, let it be anyone it may be. He's the firstborn of every creature. For Amen. by him were all things created. Amen. <laughs> all things created that are in heaven or in earth, visible, invisible. Whether they be thrones, whether they be dominions, principalities, powers, 
all things were created by him and for him. Amen. Let it be anything it might be. Amen. No other being. Amen. Notice. And in and he is therefore. He is before all things. And by him all things consist. Whether it be Father, Son, Holy Ghost, whatever it is. He is before all things. Amen. Amen. Before all things. It's in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, anything. This Son of God was before all things. Is that right? I don't care thrones, dominions, whatever it is, heavenly thrones, kingdoms, whatever it might be, in the great supernatural realms beyond in the eternities where it was, whatever it was, angels, gods, whatever it was, he's before all things. Amen. 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 Can't you see him? He was before all things and were created by him. He of 70th birth, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. There's nothing to make it run but Him. Whether it's God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, whether it's angels, principalities, doc, powers, dominions, whatever it is, all things run by Him. All things consist by Him. He and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that is, raise up what He come to redeem, that is, in all things, he might have the preeminences. By that preeminence, you know what it means? That's over all. Amen. He's over all things that Amen. was ever created, ever angel, ever being, ever everything that there is. He's over all things. Amen. What creature is this? Who can it be? Over all things. And having made peace, let's see, uh, let's see, preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in Him should all the fullness dwell. All the fullness of all things. All the fullness of God. All the fullness of angels. All the fullness of time. All the fullness of eternity. Everything dwelt in Him. That's this fellow. And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things into Himself by Him, I say... Whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. There's that great being we are talking about at the beginning of the creation of God. Now, now that the church, that his very whole purpose was the church. Now, how do we get into this church? By one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. The church, the body of Christ. It cannot fail. Now, here's what happens. Now, watch this. Just a little figurative picture here. Now, this outside man is the flesh. That's what we look at, what we see. And it has five inlets to that body. And any grammar school child as myself will know there's five senses control the body. See, taste, feel, smell, hear. Without that, you can't touch the body. That's the only way you have to the body. See, taste, feel, smell, hear. You see it, taste it, feel it. Now, that is the evil one on the outside. Now, inside of that is a spirit which you become when you're born in the earth and the breath of life is breathed into it. That spirit is of a worldly nature because it was not given from God, but it was given, permitted by God. Now, you got that? For every child that's born in the world is born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Is that right? So that person inside there is a sinner to begin with. Now, but now it's got five inlets. And that five inlets, I don't know where to call them right off now. First, I know is thought, conscience, and love, choice. No, conscience, love, reason, 
There's five inlets to the spirit. You can't think with your body. You have to think with your spirit. You can't have conscience in your body. It has no mental faculties at all. Your body does. So you have to think with your spirit. You have to... The reason, you can't reason with your physical being because reason doesn't see, taste, feel, smell, hear. Reason is what you can make in your mind. If you're asleep or you're out, your body's laying there dead, but your spirit can still reason. These five senses that controls that inside man. And that thou to the last man, which is the soul, there's only one sense that controls that. And that is free moral agencies, free will to choose or to reject. And now the reason that people today, now don't forget this now, and you, you'll see what the, holy, what the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost is. See? Now people can live in this spirit. And they dance in the Spirit. They shout in the Spirit. They go to church in the Spirit. And they can absolutely have the real Spirit of God anointed on that Spirit, but still be lost and just as devil-possessed as they can be with that Spirit. Because, watch, that's the reason you couldn't tell that woman she's wearing shorts was wrong. You couldn't tell her bobbing her hair was wrong. Well, what's your hair got to do with it? Well, it did to Samson. Right. Whosoever shall add one word to this or take one word from it, you've got to have an ultimate somewhere. Now, for instance, if I was a, 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 a Baptist man and you come down and told me I must, be, I must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. It's in the Bible. Well, the first thing you know, I said, that's my pastor. And I go to the pastor, he say, oh, that's something back there. See, yeah, see, uh, we Baptists, here's what we believe. We believe that we should be immersed in the titles of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's the way all the church has done it. Since John Smith founded it, that's the way it's done. Well, that's your ultimate. Heck with what that guy says. What if you're a Methodist and sprinkling is your system? And you're told you must be immersed. See what I mean? You go back to the Methodist pastor, he'll write and ask the bishop, so-and-so said so-and-so about this. But we, the Methodist church, who was founded three, four hundred years ago in England by John Wesley and Whitfield and all the rest of them there in Asbury, we founded this document following John Wesley that we are to be sprinkled because it's just an outward uh, emo, uh, farm. And we think it's sprinkling it's just as good. As it is the other way. If you're a real, if the Methodist Church is your ultimation, that's as far as you go. If you're Catholic, and I'll tell you, it's not in the Bible not to eat meat on uh, Fridays and all these things like this. And the Holy Eucharist isn't a way of wafer because it's a spirit and so forth. And you go to your priest, the priest say, "Here it is, wrote right in our document." And if the church is your ultimate, you don't give a hoot what anybody says. That's your ultimate. Oh, God, help this to sink in. To me, the whole thing's wrong. God's Word is the ultimate. Whatever that Word says, then that's right. Now, the only way up here in these spheres that you could ever be in this little inside man is that you have to be foreordained because you was with God. You're a part of God. I was in my father. I also was in my grandfather, my grandfather's grandfather. By seed, I was in that. And I was in Christ. Amen. You were in Christ Amen. before the foundation of the world. He came to redeem his own. Amen. His own that was in him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. His children Amen. that was in him. You never came to to save the devil's children. They never will know it. And they are so shrewd in the ways of their intellectual learning that you can't compare with them at all. You can't out-talk them. But by faith you see it. Now, science don't need any faith. 
Science proves what they're talking about. It doesn't need any faith. The Catholic priests will tell you, look how long the Catholic Church has waved. Look how long she stood on the persecutions of paganism. The Methodist Church say, look at here how long I've seen a church talk about a hypocrite sign. Coming up the road yesterday, I seen said the Church of Christ established AD 33. It ain't a hundred years old yet. <laughs> the denomination. Oh my doctrine of the apostles. Hardly got anything. They're the Sadducees of the day. No spirit, no, and you can't tell them. You can't talk to them. You can't reason with them. Because we go beyond reasoning. Amen. Lean not to your own understanding. Amen. Faith doesn't reason at all. Faith believes it. Amen. They say, now look here. You believe we have to do these things back there. Nonsense. But the Bible said so. Amen. I can't explain how it happens, but it happens. God said so. So you don't have... I can't tell you nothing about it. Faith doesn't explain it. Did you know that? Faith just believes it. Jesus said to Nicodemus from the ecumenical council of his day, come to him at night. He said, Master, we know your teacher comes from God because no man can do the things you do unless God is with him. He said, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he can't even see the kingdom. But God said, Me? An old man entered in my mother's wounds to be born? He said, Now how am I going to tell you heavenly things when you won't even believe earthly things? Then he said one day, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, you have no life in you. He didn't explain it. Those apostles and them of that day who was ordained to life, he noted that all the Father has given me will come. Amen. Only thing I have to do is just make my voice known and they know it. Amen. For my sheep know my voice. And a voice is a word expressed. Amen. They believe it anyhow. Amen. They don't have to scientifically prove anything or ask any said to see a Pharisee or anything else about it. I said it, they believe it. Amen. For my sheep hear my voice. And this is the voice of God in letter form because this is the entire revelation of Jesus Christ, Old and New Testament put together. Amen. 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 There you are. Why? You say these are good people. What makes them? Because one thing. Their tie post is on a church. And in here... You remember last Sunday, a week ago, how many was here and heard the sermon on the anointed ones in the last days? I think all of them. See, they are anointed. Their spirits are anointed. In the second realm. Now that first woman says, no, she don't give a hoot what the church says, what anybody else said. She's a smart duck. She's got college education. She can put it over on her husband and think she's smart by doing that. This other woman is naked, blind, and don't know it. Oh, it's pitiful, but that's a picture the Bible paints us. Now she goes to church. That woman would probably be better. That woman would be, she lives a good, clean life. There's nothing against that. God will be the judge of it. I don't know. I'm not the judge. I'm only the responsible for what he shows me. That's what the apostle said. We do speak that what we know, what we heard, what we see. That's all I'm responsible for. That's all you're responsible for. But now see, if you take that same woman, where did she wind up at? See, she moved right around. She heard, no doubt, turn the radio many times. The voice of God has been speaking many times. When I see, she comes over into this cult here, a clan, all churches are clans, everything. Exactly right. There are just lodges where people group together as membership. And she comes over in here. Well, that fits her just right. Now, if you go to tell her how what she has to do, she won't listen to you. You show it to her in the Bible, she won't listen to it. Now, my dear brother or sister, just one or two more comments before closing. It's quarter till time to lay out 15 minutes. Now, look, I want to ask you something. Why can't that woman see it? Why can't she? As far as being in adultery, physically to her husband, she's not guilty. She has nothing to confess. She 
plain as she was the day she was born. No man has touched her. I'm speaking parallel now to the woman to the church. She's as clean as she was born. Well, that's exactly what the church is. As she was born, but she was born in sin. Shaped in iniquity. Come. See what I mean? Now, you tell her that it's wrong for her to cut her hair. The Bible said so. It's wrong for her to wear them shorts. The Bible said so. She said, nonsense. Why? Her ultimate is not down here in the third man. The soul that's predestinated and sent from God. But her ultimate is on an organization out here. That some man is organized outside of this. See? But if the word of God is down in that soul, it says, Amen. Amen. I see it. It lines up with it. Now look here. Therefore the man that's born of the Spirit of God. See? Here's the outside flesh. Now I speak in a mixed audience, but I speak as your, as your pastor, as your brother. Here's the flesh. It's weak. It's bound to. A little lady walks down the street, some young man just at his young age, when he's 17, 18, 20 years old, 25, 30, walks around in there, and this young lady comes twisting every form of body, walking with a pair of high shield shoes on, her stuff stuck all out in front and back, and dresses that high above her knees or a pair of shorts on. Do you know the Bible said she'd act like that? Amen. You know the Bible said that's the way she'd act? Amen. How she'd be so filthy. Did you read this year, this month's Reader's Digest? That men and women of this day, little girls from 20 to 25 years old is in menopause. That you go through the change of life in the middle age of life according to science between 20 and 25. It used to be around 30 or 35 in my age. In my mother's age, a woman never struck menopause till she's 40 or 45. What is it? It's through science and the food, the hybrids. That's perverted the whole human body till we become a bunch of, of, of a mass of corruption. Well, if the physical being is corrupted, isn't the brain cell in that physical being? Amen. Now watch the spirit following it. And there will come a time in the name of the Lord that people will go completely insane. The Bible says so. They'll scream and holler. Great hideous things in their imaginary mind. The radios and things, our television programs are producing it. There'll be such things as ants raised up on the earth that'll be as high as 14 trees. There'll be a, a, a bird will fly across the earth with wings four or five miles across. And people see them. They'll scream and holler and cry for mercy. But it'll be the plagues. Wait till I preach on those plagues open up. Watch what Moses done. Under the physical being, not the spirit. When he said Moses, God said to Moses, go out there to his prophet, pick up a handful of dust, throw it up in the air and say, Thus saith the Lord, fleas will come up on the earth. There was no fleas. The first thing you know, he'd be able to see something crawl on the bush. Looked over there, something else. And after a while, they so deep you couldn't wade through them. Where did they come from? God is the Creator. Amen. Amen. He can do what He will. He's sovereign. Amen. He can make a, a bird that would reach, reach his wings from one side of the earth to the other. Amen. He said, let there come flies and cloth upon all the earth. There was a fly in the land. First thing you know, an old bull fly began to fly around. First thing is eight or ten, twelve. First thing you know, you couldn't walk through them. God the Creator keeps His word. And He stretched forth His rod at the command of God and said, Let frogs come up and cover the earth. And the frogs come till they heaped them up and piled and the state was everywhere, maybe 40 or 50 feet high of frogs. They were in the cupboard of, of Pharaoh. They were in the, turned down the sheet and there'd be a 500 frogs under the sheet. Under the bed, in the grub, everywhere you went was frogs, frogs, frogs. Where did they come from? God the Creator is solid. What He says, He'll do. And He said there'll be hideous sights upon the earth. Locusts with hair like women. 
long hair to haunt them women that cut their hair. Teeth like lime. Stingers in their tails like scorpions. They would torment men months. Just wait till we get in the open of them plagues and seals and them seven thunders. Watch what takes place. Oh, brother, you better get to Goshen while it's time to get to Goshen. Don't pay attention to this outside. Look at your ears, little lady. Twist yourself down the street. Here's a young fella. His eyes catches it. He's a member of the church. He's a Pentecostal. He's whatever he is. But the first thing you know, there's no hole post in there. She'll say, hello. He's got curly hair and kind of nice looking, straight shouldered young man. Maybe try to live right. She start walking up to him, even a preacher. The first thing you know, what is it? This out here, the flesh desire and the spirit down here yet anointed saying, don't do it. Don't do it. But what will it do? It'll move right around. There it hole. There it goes. The first thing you know, he's trying to make a date with her. He's guilty of committing adultery where he touches her or not. But a genuine born again son of God. Amen. You can't do it yourself. It's totally impossible for a, a red blooded male to walk before a female like that without something taking place. But when there is something on the inside, that little born again something here, though that man might have shouted, spoken tongue, jumped, danced, everything else anointed with the Spirit, done all the signs and wonders that God said in there by His Spirit. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, have not prophesied in your name? Have not cast out devils in your name? Have not, he said, depart from me, you that work iniquity. What is iniquity? Something that you know to do and don't do it. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I didn't even know you. But down on the inside of that man, if that little tie post is in there, that seed of God that was predestinated before the foundation of the world, I don't care what takes place. It's holding. It's there to stay. That's why that woman will wear them shorts. She's counted a prostitute the same as the woman in the act. See? She doesn't know that that spirit. How does she know her ultimate? What is an ultimate? It's the last word. The ultimate is the amen. It's the end of all strife. Your ultimate. And if your church, a Pentecostal church, that tells you that long hair stuff is just fanaticism, you got a spare tar on the back of your head, and so forth, them kind of things, the man is possessed of the devil. Amen. For God's word said, it's a shame for a woman to cut her hair. She'll dishonor her head. If she dishonors her husband, and her husband is the church, and the church is Christ. She is a dishonorable religious prostitute. Naked and don't know it. Naked, don't the Bible said the woman's covering is her hair? Isn't the hair given to her for a covering? Someday, down at the judgment bar, I've tried to pour the medicine in and hold it with my hands and you spit it right straight back out between your fingers. God will judge them someday. That's thus saith the Lord. Amen. It hasn't been a bunch of foolishness for some crazy old man all worked up. It isn't because it's a word of the Lord. Amen. And a real genuine Christian will cope with that inside man. That spirit that was back under the beginning, which is the word. As he was the fullness of all of you, you were in him back under Calvary. He foreknew you would be here. He only broadcast what would take place. And you were in and you died with him. Amen. You died to your pride. You died to your patience. Amen. You died to the world. Yes. When he who died with him in Calvary and you rose with him, when he rose again on the third day, Amen. and because you accepted it, now you're sitting in heavenly places. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. There you are. It's that inside man. Amen. That inside that will punctuate the word, hang with the word. Regard, you can't help it. I learned that many years ago. My little baby laying here dying. My wife laying here in, in, in the morgue. Embalmed and laid out. They called me out there and Sharon was dying. 
That's the hardest temptation I ever met in my life. I was about 25 years old. I walked out there, and Billy Paul ain't the part of death. Dr. Sam comes and said, Bill, I don't think we're going to save Billy. And I, he said, he's so bad. I said, Bill, I feel so sorry for you to put his arms around me. I said, Doc, I ain't got no more strength. A couple of hours, I call him my baby, Sharon, the runner out there. He just seen her in a spasm. It wouldn't stop. They put a needle in the spine and punctured it. Brought the spine out, two burker meningitis. So I waved my way out to the hospital, stopped my old truck out there and got out and started walking down the room. Here comes Sam down the hall with his hat in his hand, crying. Put his arm around him and said, come on back, Bill. I said, what's the matter? He said, you can't see her. He said, she's dying, Bill. And I said, no, but Sam, not my baby. He said, yeah. He said, don't even ask for her, Bill. She'd ever live. said, she'd be afflicted. He said, she'd always be drawn up and she'd be afflicted all of her life. He said, she's got meningitis. He said, don't go around her. You, you just kill Billy by doing it. I said, Sam, I got to see her. He said, you can't do it, Bill. I, I forbid you. Now, you know how much I think of you. You're my buddy and... Everything he said, I, how much I thank you. He said, and I, how much I believe you, Bill. He said, but don't, don't go to that baby. He said, if you do that, meningitis is on her. He said, she'll be gone in a few minutes. He said, you, we'll bury her. He said, uh, Bill, I just feel so sorry for you to call, uh, to call a nurse to order me some kind of medicine. He said, I don't know how the man's standing up. I stood there a little bit. He brought the medicine in. I sat down in the hall. He said, sat, and the nurse brought said, drink this. Uh, Brother Branham, I said, thank you. Just sit down there a minute. When she left like that, I poured over in that spittoon, set the glass back down. I said, oh, Lord, God, what have I done? You're a good God. Why did you let her die? They gave me holding her through the arms like that. Back any far. Why'd you let her go? There's Billy Lee in there dying. Here she is dying. What have I done? Tell me. Lord, I just might as well go with him. I opened the door, no nurses there, I slipped down the basement. That's for the hospital is fixed. Screens, no screens on the windows, hardly and flies on her little eyes. Had a piece of mosquito bar, we call it, netting, put over her face. I shoot the flies off, laid there. Her little eyes just suffered so hard till they were crossing. Then Satan moved up to the side of me there. Now, did you say he was a good God? I said, Yeah, I said that. Did you say he was a healer? Well, why did your father die in your arms over there and you call him, him a sinner, calling for his life? Why did your brother die in your other brother's arms out there and you stand in the pulpit preaching a few weeks ago? Said then, why didn't he answer you? You said he loved you. He saved you. He couldn't tell me he's no God because I've already seen him. But he's telling me he didn't care for me. Said there lays your wife. Your babies will be there pretty soon. Your daddy's buried. Your brother's buried. Your wife's going to be buried now tomorrow. And here's your other baby dying. He's a good God. Now he's a healer. Said, you made a sap out of yourself. What did it do? From, is working from the outside now to this first man. Said, now look. You know. When you was a few years ago, about two or three years ago, before you accepted this, was well thought of amongst the people. You lived a good, clean life. Any girl in this city want to go out, go out with you because it felt clean and decent. I stand before any of them. I never insulted one. Never said anything. She even act smart. I take her home. And you were liked amongst the people. But what are you now? A religious fanatic. That's right. I was. See these things begin to move together. The outside reasoning, the spirit. Moving these things together. That's right, Satan. Did, did you say he was a healer? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. And you begging and crying, and the people telling you it wasn't so, that you're all off the line, your own church turns you out for this, your own Baptist church down there puts you out the door for the very same cause? Yeah. Your daddy buried, your brother buried, your wife laying there to be buried. Here's your baby. Just about 15 minutes longer and it'll be gone. And he's a healer. Your own flesh and blood. One word from him would save the baby's life. 
He's a healer, you said. The people try to tell you, the preacher told you he was all messed up. You was all insane. You was a, become a religious fanatic. And you said he loved you. Could he love you? And how you cried for your daddy. How night after night you fasted and when you, in daytime when you'd have to pray to get up a pole to work. And when you let him die in your arms a sinner. How your wife, what a fine woman she was and how you loved her. Billy's mother, many of you remember Hope. What a fine girl she was. How happy you was in your little home over there was about seven or eight dollars worth of furniture. What furniture you had, but yet you loved her to you and you loved one another. And you went and prayed for others in some mental emotion. They got up and walked away and said they were all right. But now your own wife. And there she is, dead, second day now, laying in the undertaker's establishment down there, Scott and Combs. He's a healer, huh? And your little boy at the point of death, Billy Paul, 18 months old. And your little girl at eight months old is laying here dying with meningitis and you just prayed and God pulled a sheet down and said, shut up, don't hear, won't hear you at all. Turned his back on you. He's a good God, huh? He loves you. And every girl you ever went with, every boy you ever associated with, your very best friends has walked away from you as a religious fanatic. Everything he was telling me was the truth. Everything that he would say, just fall right in line. See here? I'm just then, about ready to say, then uh, that's the way he has to act. Then I won't serve him. Just as I said that, there was something come from somewhere else. Way down on the inside. I said, who are you to begin with? The Lord gave and the Lord taken away. See, that's that inside man. Don't reason at all. I looked back and I thought, how did I get on earth? I come from a bunch of drunkards. How did I get here? Who gave me life? Who gave me that wife? Who gave me that baby? Where did my wife come from? Where did my life come from? I said, no, he slay me yet. I'll trust him. I said, get away from me, Satan. I laid my hand over on the baby. I said, sure, honey, I'll lay you on your mother's arms in a few minutes when the angels of God comes to take you away. But one day, daddy will see you again. I don't know how it's going to be, honey. I can't tell you how. When he turns his back up on me, he won't even hear for you. And he let my wife die and be holding her by the hands crying for her. And my daddy in his arms died on this arm right here, looking up at me, trying to get his breath. And I prayed as hard as I could. How could I face the public again to preach divine healing? How could I preach it was a good God to let my own daddy die a sinner? How could I preach it? I don't know how. Well, I know he's right. The word of God shall never fail in a triumph, no matter what that is. Amen. Then I know there was something inside of all reasonings, something inside of all emotions, everything else like that. There was an inside man that helped in that hour. Nothing else could have done it. Every reason, everything could be showed, everything could prove that it was wrong and I was in the wrong. But the word of God that was predestinated before the foundation of the world held on the inside. I felt a little wind come through the building. Her spirit went to meet God. Brother, sister, let me tell you, that's the only thing. Don't try to reason it out. Don't try to have long hair because I said so. Don't try to do these things just because in your flesh. Don't try to do it just kind of cope up. But just wait before the Lord. Though something weighed down on the inside. Many of you think because you've got long hair, that means you're going to go to heaven. That doesn't mean that. Many of them think because you're a good moral woman, you're going to go to I don't mean that. Many of them think because their churches and belong to this and this great groups and great doctors of divinity, I don't mean that. Think. Many think because they speak with tongues, they've got the Holy Ghost. I don't mean that, though the Holy Ghost does speak with tongues. But until that real, genuine Holy Spirit in there will cope with every word. If that Holy Spirit in you makes you speak with tongues, looks back there and doesn't agree with the rest of the word, then it's the wrong spirit. It's got to come from the inside, which is the word from the beginning. In the beginning of the creation of God, when God began to create, bring you into existence, you see, you started back there as a seed and worked down to where you are now. And then you were all in Christ. 
Then when Christ died, he died to redeem all of you. And you are part of this world. And how can a, the Bible, all of it, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little, not one jot or tittle shall fail. How in the world can you be part of that word, disagree with the rest of it? Or any part of it? God bless you. I'm over time now. I didn't mean to do is keep you that long. Sorry. That I kept you. Not sorry for what I said. We're right at the end of something, friend. All of you here, I guess, are just a member of the church. I don't get around in time to see what members there is. I imagine all of you are constant comers here. Let me tell you something that happened. Will you spare, say, six more minutes? Is that Reverend Mr. Old Walker here from Oregon that was here that, that Sunday I was here? Anybody know about it was a very strange thing. I come down here. There's so many people in. I, I, had, I had a pile of interviews. Like, and every one of them worthy. Their children married drunkards and, and different things. Just the things that was worthy. Every one of them should have been seen. I can't do all that. And I commit you to God and hold my hands over them. Oh, God. I, I couldn't do it. Get to them, Lord. Do uh, You know how to do it. I pray for each one. Billy called me, and I just come in with Brother Banks. He said, Danny, you, you... And look, I see people drive by out there sometime in the lane, look in, and I look out at them and wave at them like that, and they, they almost turn their head. I don't want you to do that. The other day when they was buying that place out there in Tucson from me living... Brother Tony had a place up there one by me for about three or four times what this place cost. He even wanted to put in so many thousand dollars on himself. But the only way he'd get in there, a gate man is standing out there, a great big well, uh, addition up there. But any of the uh, people lives there, you have to have a written permission. Then this gate man calls you to see if it's all right for them to come in. I said, could you imagine me, my brothers and sisters who come to see me, that wants to shake my hand and Ask God's blessings for me. You, could you imagine me put myself in there, Tony? He said, what do you have? To? I said, Tony, the way the church and all of them has the people not to come around. I said, that's for people who's got everything they want me to do. They, they say, well, the Lord told me, hallelujah. I'm going to stay right here. Glory to God. Uh, uh, the Lord told me you have to hold a meeting over here in our group. Yes, sir. Glory to God. The God told me that. If you don't do it, Brother Bram, you're a short backslid. Me and they are trying to study. See, that's what. See, and a many a good person. It's beat out of coming in because of that. Just like a man going hunting out here on a farm. A farmer say, come on in, you can hunt. And he get out there and shoot one of these cows. A rabbit run under a cow and he shoot the rabbit anyhow. You get up on the fence instead of going to the post and climb over like a decent man should do. Climb up on the fence and break it down like that. See? And then he say, I'll post the place. I don't, I don't blame him one bit. Not one bit. Well, what does he do? He keeps the decent hunter from coming in. It's always that way. It's the evil that keeps the good from having the preeminences. It's always. Now, but then people are, thousands are really needy and nice people, loving people, full of God's grace. Now we have this, uh, how these people come like that. We don't, we don't want that. No. But this man, come, Billy said, run down now right quick, Daddy. said, Mrs. Waldorf's down here with some people dying. I see him right at once, and I run in, come down here, and coming back, they said, there's nobody down here but a man sleeping on the side of the side out there, on a pillow every day, on the side of the building. He said, he wants you to pray for him. I said, all right. He said, I'll put him in. I come in, a, I think a Cadillac sitting back here in the back, or some kind of a big car. I rode in, with, and he, that man said, how do you do? He didn't know me, and I walked in, and a, a Sister Waldorf, poor old thing, come in. You know, she was, you know her case, don't you? See, she had cancer, died in the prayer line about an hour before it got to her, and her doctor comes show that's been about 18 years ago. Cancer in the heart. See? And she's living today. And she's living in Arkansas now, and she was in Phoenix then. And she said, Brother Willie, I hated to come in like this, but said I didn't have no place to stay. Hated to say this paper, this woman's going to die. Oh, Brother Willie said, I wanted to bring you a little offering in my hand, Brother Willie. Said, but I couldn't do it, but I can some blackberry jelly. Oh, 
When I went up there and seen them little glasses of jelly she had sitting in her eye, it looked too sacred for me to eat. That dear little old woman, about 70 years old. I said, Sister Hattie, I, I couldn't say no. No, Jesus seen that widow putting in three pennies, and he, he let her home. See, oh, God will reward her for it. Yeah. And so the Lord healed the woman, healed all she had, revealed to her a pastor what he should, had on his mind, what he's supposed to do, another thing. And oh, they all went out shouting. Then Billy ran in and said, Daddy, that man's gone. I can't. I said, Who's that out there in the car? Oh, I said, Some guy come down from Oregon. Said he's got some kind of a dream, and I told him I wouldn't give you no false hope. It's 300 here waiting now. And said. And I told him, just write the dream out. I said, I got a pile of them in here that high anyhow, and I just added to it. I said, bring him in. Give him five minutes. Well, as soon as the man walked in, five minutes, he said, I'm Reverend Walker. I think his name was from Oregon. I think he's a, some other denomination. I don't know, Presbyterian, Presbyterian, something. He said, I met you about 20 years ago. I come down to Grants Pass for you. Not Grants Pass, but uh, um, I forget the name of the place. There said, whole country headlines in paper every morning. Said everybody knew about it. Said I couldn't even get to the building where he's at, but I seen you go up one day on the street. I walked up, said four or five men around you, and I shook your hand. And you, I told you I was Brother Walker, and you told me who you was. So we passed a couple words, and then three or four big men with you just pushed you on. He said I wasn't your critic, and I wasn't for you. He said I just didn't understand. He said it went on that way for a few years, and after a while, said I a man told me to come listen to some tapes about three years ago. He said the man played the tapes. And when he did, he said, I heard him talk, said, this man believed that you was a, a prophet. Well, I said, I told the man, I don't know about those things. Might be for all I know. So I said, then another man moved into our town, had a meeting, and I met him, and he said, I'm God's prophet for this day. He said, how many of you guys are the anyhow? I said, I, I, I hear where the, a man down here has listened to tapes, said, William Branham back in the east was a prophet of the day and things like that. He said, this man, I ain't going to call his name because it don't sound right here, he's in. And uh, he said, I know William Branham. said, but he's all false in his doctrine. said, he isn't Pentecostal. He doesn't believe in initial evidence. And said, another thing he says, he's major and minor prophets. There is no such a thing. said, you're a prophet or not a prophet, and that's all. He said, well, mister, I didn't argue with you about it. I just said, I heard this man say that this man, William Branham, if this man claimed that he was a prophet. So I just wondered how many there were. He said, but I want you to know this. I'm the prophet of this age. He said, well, you are. I said, the Lord bless you and be with you. He went on and repeated attention to it. He said, he started on amongst his brethren a series of three or four meetings. And he went down to the post office and said, don't, don't change my mail. Leave it here until I come back about four or five days later. All right, they said. They put a ticket up there not to change it. He went down and seen his daughter. And on the road out, he, uh, he stopped at a church. And he had that night's meeting, and next morning he said he just happened to think, go get general delivery. And when he did, one letter had creeped through the post office and got to his daughter. His daughter sent there general delivery, and he opened it up and said it was a man, Mr. Hildebrand, which is a friend of mine that had been the man paying the tapes. He said, Mr. Hildebrand, I had a word from Roy Borders, and that's one of the managers, you know, that I was going to hold a meeting back here for, from the 28th to the 1st, come back and see for himself. He said, now look at here. Them guys trying to pull me in something like that. See? And he just flipped the letter over in the wastebasket and went on. See, like that. Went on in, held that meeting that night, and the next morning, then he started holding his heart to cry right there in the room. He said, Mr. Branham, I realize I got to stand before God. He said, I don't know where I sleep or what happened. He said, I dreamed, I'm going to say I was asleep and I dreamed. He said, I thought my son in the market stuck his hand in a, a sack. He said, when he did the sack of apples, and they all turned over. He said, when I went to pick them up, there's all green apples with one bite taken out of them. So I was picking them up, put them back in the sack. He said, some of them rolled out and rolled down. So I went to try to get them and under, on the grass. And said, they rolled under one of these chain lock fences. And there's a big super highway running there. I looked back east, and he said, the, the, the chain was hooked against a, a big rock back in the east. And I went back there. I thought, I'll let this chain down, then go over and get the apples for the man. Said, so I started to let the chain down. Said, so the voice shook the whole earth. Said, so the earth shook from under my feet. I so said, after I quit shaking, I heard a voice that said, Brother Bram, it's your voice. Said, so I know it is something said that's it. Said, so it said, I'll ride this trail once more. Said, so I started looking up the rock like this, look on in past the clouds, and way up there, standing on a rock that reached from the east to the west in a pointed shape like that, like a pyramid. Run back here to the east. And said, there he was standing there 
on a horse that I've never seen anything like it in my life. Great white horse, white mane hanging down, and said he was dressed like an Indian chief with all the things the Indians used. He said he had a breastplate, and then bangles on the arms, and all down around like that. He said you had your hands up like that. He said that horse stand there like a military horse with a prance like this, walking. He's standing still. He said you pulled on the reins, went riding off towards the west. He said I looked down there, there's a whole lot of scientists. And the next morning, that was Saturday, on the next morning I preached on scientists, you know, being of the devil. And said scientists as they were pouring things in tubes and mixing it. Said you stopped the horse, raised up your hands again and screamed, I'll ride this trail once more. And said the whole earth shook. Then people shook. So they looked up and looked one another like that and looked up to you. They just shrugged their shoulders and went on with their scientific research. And said you started going on towards the west. And when it did, said I seen this man that called himself a prophet. You know what? Said he come up on a horse that was mixed with white and black together. And said he got up behind this great big horse Said it was say way up above the clouds in the road was over about that wide. And said that horse just starts of the wind blowing, the feathers and everything on on your garb, and said then the horse mane and tail blowing, great master, big white horse, walking right line, and said and said this guy run up behind, she come from towards Canada, and the man lives in Canada. And he said, Come back, and said he took his little horse trying to knock your big horse off, turn him around, make his hips. He gets the, said, never move the big horse. He just kept walking. So then all of a sudden, said, you turn around. So that would be the third time you'd spoke, but the second time you'd said, all right. And said, you didn't speak like you did. You commanded. Said, you turn around and call the man my name. And said, get off of here. You know that no man can ride this road here without God be ordained him to do it. Get off of here. And said, the man turned around. It said the man has wrote me letters and said across his horse's hips, that black and gray and mixed up together, said across his horse's hips was wrote his name signature just exactly like he's on his letter. And he rode off towards the north. Said then you went on down, that big horse turned around way as far west as you could. Said he stood and raised your hands up like that, and then he started crying. Said, Brother Bram, see that horse down there, that you know, war bonnet and everything like that. And said that breastplate and everything shining. Said he held your hands up a little while and said he looked down again, picked up the reins, and said, I'll ride this trail just once more. Said the whole earth shook back and forth like that. And said there was no more life left in me. I just fell down inside the rock and I woke up. Said, What does it mean, sir? I said, I don't know. Next morning, Junior Jackson, who dreamed about the pyramid, you know, when I went out west, you remember that? He called me a month or two before that. He had a dream this burning he had to tell me. And I said, Billy, there's about 20 standing out there. He said, Junior Jackson out there said he had to tell you that dream. I said, send him in just about five minutes. He brought his wife in and he said for a witness. He said, I dream, Brother Branham. Me and my wife was out riding. He said, I looked back in the east and I saw it look like a spot, like one of them flying saucers. See, the world don't know what that is, you know. You know, it's on. We know what it is. We know it's investigating judgment angels, you see, and how at the Pentagon, all about how it comes right down to the intelligence, how they go like a flash and be gone, pull away from anything they got. See, they don't realize what it is, see. Let them think whatever they want to. They call it flying saucers or whatever. They don't know, see. Then it, I seen it coming, and I watched it. And what it was is a man on a horse. It said it's coming with lightning speed. So said, I seen it's going to come down in front of me, and I stopped my car, jumped out. When it did, said the car, horse is standing on the road, a great white military horse, walking in a prance. That's the word, of course, you know. Walking in a prance. Said there's a man sitting on there. Said he is dressed in Western garb. He wasn't a cowboy, but said looked like a chief over rangers or something. See, all of his chief authority from the West, the Indians over the Indians, rangers over. They, and said the man had his head pulled down and had his look sideways. And said when he turned sideways, said it was you, Brother Branham. Said you never talked like you did. He said, Junior! Called him three times. He said, I'll tell you what to do. I said, then you pulled up on the reins of this horse. He made about three lopes and took to the skies. You were gone. Towards the west. He said, just a minute, I looked around, and here come a horse smaller than that, and of the same breed, but smaller, and stood. So I walked around. I said, he must have sent this back for me. Said I got in. Junior's done a little riding too. He said, "You know how your saddle fits your brother Brandon, the stirrups and everything." Said I thought, "Well, this fits me just right." Said I pulled up on the reins, off to the skies. Said I pulled on the reins and stopped him, turned him around and went back. See? When I went back, 
then I stopped the horse, got off the open wipe, the horse is gone. And he was worked up. Then, day before yesterday, three days ago, come Leo Mercer, coming down with exactly the same dream, not knowing nothing about it. About trying to breed a big white stallion to a black mare. And they couldn't do it, nervous. So I walked up there, said, Leo. And told him what I did. I don't want to say it here, see. I told him what I did, said, don't you see not to know this. I didn't know Ed Dalton had a son-in-law, and a son-in-law had a dog with this name. You'll know, Leo, as you're dreaming, but when you wake up, remember it. And said, I never heard such a command. About that time, Roy Roberson come in and said, Brother Bram, you remember back there before you left the church the first time? We, I seen you sitting like in Palestine with all the board and everything, sitting like the Lord's supper table. And then you're talking, you, you wasn't sure what you're talking about, so the white cloud come down and got you. Patch away. How many remembers the, the dream of Brother Roy? And said, the white cloud patched you away. And said, then you was gone. And I walked through the streets screaming and crying. When I come up out here, that little old arm crippled up like I was reading this. He dropped the rake and started crying when he seen me come up out there. I hadn't seen him, so he'd tell me the dream. And he said, and he was raking. I said, and, and you went away. He said, I walked the streets everywhere trying to find you. I couldn't find you nowhere. I screamed, oh, brother, round, don't leave. So a white cloud come in and got you and packed you away from us towards the west. As before the pier made or anything. That packs you towards your And I cried and I walked the streets of Dutch while I went and set the table. I had to look up there at the head of the table. So I could just see that much of you as Snow White. They just stand there and said, You spoke with authority. There was no guessing to it. That every man understood exactly what you were saying. Oh, my brother, sister. Now, everyone in the conscious, I know what that means. See? Just watch. Stay close to Christ. Let me warn you now as a minister of the gospel of this. Don't take any foolishness. Don't imagine anything. Stay right there until this inside of the inside is anchored to the word that you're writing Christ because that's the only thing that's going to Because we're in the most deceiving age that we ever lived in. It would deceive the very elected if it was possible because they have anointing. They can do anything like the rest of them. Clean your lives up. Pay your debts. Oh, no, man. Jesus said, no, no, I mean like your house rent stuff. You got to do it. Get all your things off your hands. Get everything right. Make ready. Get ready. Remember in the name of the Lord, something's fixing to happen. I'm going into the hills this week. Not exactly this. Hunt squirrels, of course, I like to hunt squirrels. But I'm going out there for this purpose, saying, Oh, God, I don't know which way to move. And I don't want to miss this. Help me. You pray for me, will you do it? I'll be praying for you. I hope by the mercies of God that I meet every one of you. We meet in a better land than this year. And what are we coming here for? What are we doing? Are we coming here playing a game? Are we coming here meeting as a lodge? It's... Christ can't come until that church is perfectly right. He's waiting on us. I believe we're at the end. Look at California. Look at the riots. Look at 19 people being killed. Racial. Didn't I tell you you're not long ago that that Martin Luther King would lead his people to a massacre? How many remembers that? It isn't them colored people. It's them leaders. Stir them up. It is an integration, segregations, and whatever they want to call it. It's the devil. Amen. It's right. Not only to the white colored, it's to all of them. It's the devil, the mental faculties and reasons a man is broke down. There's no hopes. It's beyond hope. The whole thing is a putrid sore. The mental faculties of man, they can't make decisions. I'm not a politician. I don't, neither Democrat or Republican. They're all filthy. I'm for one kingdom, and that's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's all. But how in the world did you ever see a bunch of puppets like we got up there now? Like that bunch of Texans we got in there? Why, they 
said, whatever the people want, if they want communism, we'll give them communism. If they want integration, we give them integration. If they want segregation, we give whatever. Where is man? Oh, God, that's like the pulpit. Where is man? Man that's man that stands for a principle. Where is women that stands for a principle? Where is a church that stands for a principle? I got a nickel's worth of time for a wishy-washy, give-in, compromising spirit. A woman's a woman, let her be lady. If a man's a man, let him be man. If he's a president, where is our John Quincy Adams? Where's our Abraham Lincoln's? I had a principle. Where's our Patrick Henry? Said, give me liberty or give me death. Where's the man that stands for what's right? Where's the man that's not afraid to speak out? Regardless, the whole world's against him. Speak out for what's right and stand for it and die for it. Where is our honor of our lick when we it again today? Where is the man of integrity? Where is man with spirit? They're so wishy-washy and gone up until they don't know where they stand. God, let me stand for the principles of one man as a minister, the word of Jesus Christ. For heavens and earth will pass away, but it will never fail. Amen. On this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let us stand. Bless be a time that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred mind is life to that above. Not join your hands to one another. When we, we a son their part it gave us in word pain but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to me This is a word of prayer. Be back tonight now. We're expecting a great service tonight here at the tabernacle. God bless you. And pray for me. I'll pray for you. Don't think that I'm a fanatic, friends. Don't think I'm trying to push something on you. I love you. And I have a principle. That's the Bible. Not one word can be taken from it. Not one word can be added to it. I believe it the way it's written. Let's bow our heads now. Our loyal good pastor dismissed the congregation. God bless you, Brother Neville.